Phoenix, and today I'm going to be chatting with wonderful Gary Goretz about his gouache paintings. And we're going to be looking at a lot of his art, many, many uh, sketches in gouache that he took, uh, when, that he made when he was in Morocco. And his art is absolutely stunning, really gorgeous. You're going to love it. You're just going to drool. It's so beautiful. If you're new to Studio 56, you should know that in addition to hosting these free interviews and free demos, uh, we also produce online workshops that you can enroll in, and we organize travel workshops for artists in gorgeous locations all around the world. This year, we still have some tickets available for workshops coming up uh, in the summer in Edinburgh, Paris, the French Alps, Brittany, and Malta. Tickets are still available. Please visit our website, www.studio56boutique.com. And now let me tell you a little bit about Gary Goretz. Gary is a professor at the Otis College in California, and he teaches a lot of subjects. He's really an expert drawing, background design, vehicle design, portrait and costume drawing, landscape and environmental drawing. He teaches storyboarding and figure drawing, and that's just to name a few. He was the courtroom sketch artist at the O.J. Simpson criminal trial. <laughs> wow. Um, and he's the author of Five Minutes Sketching, Animals and Pets, and also a book called Animal Drawing. Uh, he has traveled, sketched, and painted throughout the United States, Europe, and parts of Asia and Africa. But today we're going to be focusing on his gouache paintings that he did in Morocco. So let's bring Gary into our call. Hey, hey. Hi, Gary. So great to see you. Hey, folks. I hope I didn't miss anything on your long CV. No, that was that just encapsulated it in about two minutes. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, Gary, um, I first discovered your uh, paintings, I think, on uh, social media. And okay. I started seeing these paintings coming through in gouache, which is a flat kind of medium and uh, really distinct, really different from watercolor. And uh, it really caught my eye because of uh, your technique, but also because it's Morocco. And uh, I've traveled to Morocco and I saw these paintings of like the the uh, leather dyeing vats. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've been right in there in that exact spot. And it, it's, a, it, it's the most horrendous smell that you've ever smelled, but your paintings were so beautiful. You almost Thank forgot you. how bad it smelled there, but... Uh, Anyway, um, so I'm hoping that you can teach us a little bit about gouache today because sure. I really know nothing about gouache. Um, so as a medium, how does it compare to watercolor in terms of, you know, transparency and so on? Well, you know, that's that's one thing I really like about gouache because I'm an old watercolorist. You know, I would say old. I always done watercolor, right? It's a great travel medium and always used it. And I'll tell you, though, that the thing about it that, it may be trans, sort of transform is I used to work over at uh, Dis used to teach at Disney uh, animation and they gave me, you know, they would take me down to the vaults, you know, where all of the old stuff was, you know, the background paintings from Pinocchio and, and all that, you know, jungle book, the old one in, they're all done in gouache. And when you look at them and they're just these luminous, beautiful things. And the, the thing I, I was picking up when I was going there and looking is the fact that, there's a lot of texture that you can use in gouache, right? And I've always been sort of a texture guy. You know, I've always loved like looking at an oak tree or, you know, just like the the uh, bark and just the way it's put together and kind of the physics of it. And, uh, the, you know, that's where I, I sort of transcended that. And then also painting with people that are in like in the industry is a lot of them use gouache, right? Even though I was a watercolorist. And it is just basically a thicker watercolor you know, if you if you kind of make that transition in your head, that it's not a separate thing; it's just a, sort of an add-on, yeah. and I, I, it just it just kind of grew on me the fact that um, you could layer the stuff up, and frankly, uh, when you know, when I personally, when I did watercolors, I was just not not nervous about it, but it, like it seemed like you had a one go at it. Like if you did more than one pass, you'd screw the whole thing up, yeah. and with gouache. 
it was I could find I could like layer stuff. I was really I was really careful and use different brushes and I could come up with a lot of textures, right? Um and I think that's that's the way it grew on me and it's very uh mobile, right? So um it it works really super well for travel. And I found that that's like like again, if I'm going for a certain kind of surface or texture, it works gangbusters. Yeah. Okay, so let me get this straight. You can layer in oh, yeah. watercolor, uh, but those are transparent layers. Yeah. But when you're layering in gouache, those are opaque layers. Is that right? But you know what? You can you I I basically start mine out uh, as watercolor. In fact, there's one of them. I think you'll probably see. It's a woman walking down some stairs, and there's like uh, that's basically was just completely start out as a watercolor because that watercolor gives me the first safe pass on stuff. I can. I can sort of get the whole composition set up, the lighting, uh, the scene, a whole bunch of stuff, and then pick and choose how I like what sections I may want to give a little bit more opacity to or texture to, you know. Okay, so you're saying that you would do a sometimes you would do a watercolor base and then you would put the gouache on top. Oh, all the time. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm a chicken. I'm a chicken. I need that first. I need that first pass where I can kind of like, okay, everything's cool. I guess I kind of got the idea. And then I can, I can go after, you know, I can go layer upon layer after that. Yeah. And then, and then choose what I want to be able to give a little bit more, let's call it solidity to it. Or if there's a certain texture, uh, like rust on top of uh, metal or a certain kind of like water, water, I'll use, a, I mean, you would think I'd use a lot of transparency, but I use a lot of uh, opacity to it just because it, it's got a lot of power to it. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> you're raising a lot of questions for me. Um, first of all, I think you can mix gouache and watercolor, right? Yeah. Because uh, I I have a white gouache in my watercolor palette mm -hmm. that I use. Um, uh, that I you know I I would mix sometimes with yeah. to get a more of a, a pastel kind of color. Um. So why would you, so why, why gouache for you and not just watercolor? It's the, it's the, the texturing, the layering. It, I hate to put it this way is that you can really screw up on sections when you're using gouache. And if you kind of learn how to use it, I'm, you can go right over the top of a previous screw up, or you can have a thick paint. Yeah. And then you can like re-energize it, rewater it, and then put more color into that, and you'll pick up the painting underneath, and it doesn't look muddy. So that's like that was my problem when I did watercolor is if I right. made a mistake, you, you go over it and over it, and like oh my god, I lost the transparency and the beauty of it. Yeah. And that's the thing I like about um, gouache is that you know you can you can kind of get in there, and you, of course we have our happy little accidents that happen all the time, but you can go in and you can pull up a previous layer. With yeah. a you know certain kind of like even on your brush strokes, whether it's a dry brush or whether it's got a little bit more um, uh, wetness to it, and you can come up with some really really super almost uh, oil paint like uh, brush strokes on it. That's why I like it. I just want to see if there is some questions up here. I'm looking at the back screen. Um, so Fran says uh, you say it travels well. Can you describe how you travel with it? And, you know, your sort of tricks for traveling with gouache. She says, well, it seems pretty messy to travel with to me. I'm going to hold something up. This okay. thing. This is a, it's a transom box. And a C, it's got a rubber seal on it. And you can turn it upside down. You can throw it in a backpack. See, I do a lot of hiking. So a lot of times when I'm traveling, all this stuff goes into a backpack. And I got it down to like about, oh, two, three pounds. And this thing has a, you know, I'll just take and show you. So Gary, are those, um, each little section, are those paints dry or are they wet in there? Well, they're, they're, they're dry right now, but what I do the night before I go anywhere is I just take a little spray bottle, okay. spray some water into them, let them rest overnight with the, uh, chances are with the cover on it. And then by the next morning, they're all charged up. That's why I like using this thing is that like the old times when I used to use cakes, you know, they used to come in cakes. Um, I found that I, you have to just go in there and just pound away at the cakes to get to energize the color. Well, this is wet. So all you do is when you take a brush, 
is, and that's the nice thing I like about gouache too, is that all you got to do is almost lay the brush right on top of the of the color, and it pops right out. And then I use, I got a tray, it sits inside the tray. Right. So then I have a mixing area, and then I have this over here. Okay. So the co the colors end up being a lot more saturated and a lot more vibrant. Then yes, I can see that from your sketches that yeah. they really are very vibrant. Um, uh, and so, like when I when I mean travel well, is, um, and then I got my you know my brush case that I got a, over here. That's what I mean by travels really well. Is that you can just beat the living tar out of this stuff, and like you know I, I took it on backpacking trips and um, just all over the place, and like throwing it in packs. Um, that's because that's the way I travel. Yeah. And it worked, you know, again, with you can turn it upside down, it's pressurized. So once you put the top on it and it's sealed, is that for the most part, the paint can't dribble down and then out the sealed air edges. It stays right in there. Yeah. It's really cool. Okay, cool. Uh, so a few questions. Peter's asking, uh, how does gouache compare with acrylic? And Carolyn uh, also asked the same question. Does acrylic uh, do the same? No. Uh, are you able to layer acrylic in the same, uh, sorry, are you able, to, the question is, are you able to uh, layer gouache in the same way you do acrylic? No, yeah, yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> bad answer, bad answer in the fact that if you're careful with it, yeah, you can put on real sort of special layers, one over the top of the other. Um, I, I personally don't use acrylics because uh, I don't like, I actually like the, the happenstance mixing that goes on with gouache, where again you get you can get like all sorts of funky mixtures if you know how to manufacture it right. You can make really really super uh, warm and cool neutral colors, and they just shine. That's that's one of the things I like about it. It's like shadow colors just come alive with gouache because yeah. you can do a lot of mixing with it. Um, I don't, I don't use a lot of gua uh, excuse me a lot of acrylic because I don't like the plasticity of the look of it. I'm sorry, but that's just me. Um, this stuff, you know, again, gouache has a really nice kind of shine to it. not shine to it, but just a nice glow to it when you put it out in the light. Yeah, yeah. And and the colors are really I, the other nice thing I like about gouache is um, the colors are the the drying time is about the same as watercolor. It okay. just is almost simultaneous, but you can get a lot more um, like subtle mixtures. I find again, I'm not a I'm not an expert on acrylic, so it it you know that's just my opinion. But I tried painting in acrylic; it just dries too fast, and it's got too much of a plasticky look to me. Yeah, yeah, it does. I I I painted quite a lot in acrylic. It's it's a difficult medium. You better make your decision quick because it's gonna. Yep. Absolutely. And then if you don't look at you can peel it off like a layer of plastic. <laughs> um, so a lot of questions here. People sure. have people want to know. Uh, I, I'm not surprised. Um, so a few like technical things. Judy is asking, um, could you say again how you use gouache so it feels like oil strokes? Did it's, you say that? Uh, yeah, you can uh, what you can do is you can mix up these really thick mixtures of the stuff. I mean, it's it's in between oil paint and watercolor, but you can mix up some pretty thick mixtures, and then it'll take a little bit of time to dry on the palette. And so by the time it is, it'll it'll come up. You can literally take your brush and scoop the stuff out of the pan, and then do some really nice dry brush stuff on top. And then uh, you can you you can get marbleizing off your your gouache. I mean, you can mix two or three colors like right next to each other and take a brush and scoop them up. And you'll have the integrity of each one of those colors next to the other. And then when you put them down on the page or the whatever you're painting on, is that it'll do this really nice sort of looks like railroad tracks right next to each other. I'm sure you've seen that in oil painting, right? Yeah. Where it'll, it'll actually do that. You can get these really, really nice. My, I got a friend named Mike Hernandez who's just like just uses that to the nth degree and comes out with really wonderful combinations of greens and reds and blues and just one stroke. Right. You're not going to do that with watercolor. Yeah, see, that's the thing I like. And then, then you can go over the top of that and, and dry brush that over the top of something else. And it makes a really nice uh, effect, like on rocks, on the side of boats. Uh, some of those boat paintings that you saw from Morocco, I used that technique. I'd actually mix the color up in the pan 
and leave it for about one minute. And then, you know, it's like you have a timer in your head and you just go, okay, now it's ready. You scoop it up. It's sort of like pudding. And then you can pop it on top of the painting. Yeah. So let's, uh, I, there's quite a few questions still, yeah. but let's turn off our cameras. You and sure. I will bring up uh, some of the art and then people can have a look at it. And I will continue to um, ask those questions that people have asked. So um, gorgeous, gorgeous sketch from Morocco. And uh, rather than talk about the sketch, I want to work through some of these questions still while people sure. are looking at the sketch. So Virginia is asking, do you carry two palettes, one for each medium, uh, meaning watercolor and gouache? No, nope, no, nope, just one. Because I, I basically, when I when I paint gouache, it's I just consider it like a slightly thicker watercolor. You can get it super thin. I mean, if you look at the sides of some of those buildings, those are done in one pop and are like one stroke and yes it's a little bit more opaque and a little bit i wouldn't say chalky but a little bit more thicker but that's the way i paint it yeah i think the question is do you carry two palettes like a watercolor palette nope. and a gouache palette nope. that thing i that that uh, palette i showed you is what everything i carry oh so you have the watercolor is in there as well no the, the, i don't carry watercolor at all i just paint like it's watercolor if that makes any sense oh i'm sorry i thought you said earlier that you usually do a painting sort of get the basics down in watercolor first, then you paint on top of that with gouache. No, it's, um, the, the gouache is so close to watercolor in a lot of respects that I just transfer my old techniques into using it in gouache, if that makes any sense. Okay, so what you're saying is that you, you start off your sketch with a very thin layer oh, yeah. of gouache that's like watercolor. Yes, exactly. Sorry, right. sorry I didn't explain that right, but... Uh, Okay. No, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense now. And I'm glad to know you're only carrying one palette. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd have to bring a mule with me to carry everything if I started carrying all sorts of stuff. <laughs> okay. And uh, Mar Margarita is asking, um, she says, I admire Gary so much. It's great to be able to listen to him. I I'd ask about paper, what paper he likes best to work on with gouache and if he likes mixed media paper. You know what? I use uh, pretty a pretty thick watercolor paper. Uh, in fact, it's all sketchbooks. I mean, so you can see this is an Etcher uh, perfect sketchbook that they gave me, which was really nice. And I like this stuff a, real, a lot because it's a, it's a cold press. And once again, the more rougher texture uh, allows me to dry brush stuff or get a little bit more texture on it. Uh, unfortunately, the, the downside is, is that when I want to come in and use a fountain pen or something for... I wouldn't say details, but for like stuff on the ins information on the inside, it has a tendency to kind of um, soak into the page and you can't get a real fine line. So I use a ballpoint pen, but uh, that's what I generally use is that. And so I'm using an etcher and for the smaller ones, it's an Aretza or handbook. And then for the really big ones, you'll see it. I think of the boats later. That's a CY to Brighton. Yeah, that's an etcher book too. Okay, etcher. So I'm gonna just I, I, tell me again. It's an etcher, and what's what's the spec on it? What's that again? Uh, it's an etcher brand. Okay. And, and it's a cold. It's a cold press. Cold press, and what's the size? Uh, just for eight by eleven. I think they call, they call it an A five. A five. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I I want to write it down because I know someone's gonna ask. Someone will email me and say, "Can you tell me again the kind of book?" <laughs> Well, I use I use a combination. So on if I'm um, here's a good uh, if I'm wandering around a city like this is in Tetouan in uh, Morocco and it's really wet and it's raining like crazy like it is in L.A. right now. Yeah, there we go. And um, I'll probably I'll usually take the uh, this one, which is the portrait one, because you can see the scene right down the middle of it. And then if I'm if it's a little bit more sunny and I have uh, there's going to be a little bit more of a panorama then I'll take the landscape one, which is a horizontal format. Okay, I think we have some of those coming up. Yeah. Uh, so Regula is asking, do you add anything to your paint to prevent molding? Yeah, I will uh, I take a, one of those little optometrist bottles, you know, the, the little spritz bottles, uh -huh. and then I'll pour in some water and then about a qu like three quarters of the water or four fifths of its water, and then I'll pour in a little bit of rubbing alcohol and then spray the rubbing alcohol into the mixture, into the uh, actual paint bo uh, boxes. So you're spritzing this onto the your palette? Yeah. 
Okay. In that how little often, box pallet thing. How often do you do that? Um, once every couple of weeks. Okay. Huh. Interesting. And yeah. Virginia is asking, do you use watercolor blending medium with your gouache? No, no. Okay. And uh, Tiffany is asking, how do you stop the paint from going moldy within the transom box? Um, That's sometimes how. you, it depends on how long that you've gone without painting. I mean, sometimes uh, I have a couple of these boxes, right, that have different mixtures of paint. I'll leave one alone for a month. And then sometimes some organic stuff will get a little bit of a beard, a mold beard around the edges of it. And I, but I'll, what I'll do is I'll either just scrape a little bit of it out and then spray some more spritz in. And it takes care of it real fast. I mean, I've been painting using this stuff for, I don't know, 10 years. And I've never seen, I've gone back to some of my paintings from 10 years ago. And it hasn't, you know, it hasn't evolved and something hasn't popped out from using that, uh, that solution. I mean, it hasn't ruined a painting. Okay, so what's the, uh, what is the ratio of water to rubbing alcohol? Oh, usually about uh, four-fifths water and then one-fifth rubbing alcohol. Okay, I didn't, wasn't even aware that this is a problem, but, um, and one-fifth alcohol. Okay, and, but there, I can see that some people are, a lot of people are asking questions about it. Um, Jan Janet asked, do you ever have a problem with mold? And Lee yeah. is asking, do you ever have trouble with the gouache molding in the palette? So I didn't know that that was a problem. Yeah, just a little, but it's a little, it's not, so, it's like the chemical one, the chemical based parts of the paint, like the Windsor's, like Windsor greens and stuff like that. I don't have to worry about it. The cadmiums, I don't have to worry about it. It's more sort of uh, a little bit more on the, the organic ones that have uh, like my uh, uh, burnt umbers and the earth colors. And then a couple of greens, I'll have a little bit of problem on. But if you, if you just maintain it, you paint a lot it's it's not that much of a problem and even if it comes up you just take a little palette knife i got a little palette knife and i'll just scrape it off the edge and then sp spritz in some uh, some of that solution and then even that solution will knock the the uh mold back interesting i never i didn't realize that was a problem yeah um, so sarah and lydia are asking about the that box that you showed yeah um, so you're squeezing gouache out of a uh, tube into the box, and they want to know what's the name of that box and where they can get it. It's, it's a transom box, T-R-A-N-S-O-N. You can find them on uh, on all sorts of them. There's a bunch of Chinese knockoffs. So like I noticed that the brand name that I have one week, three weeks later, it will change to another one. But if you type in transom box or palette, and then just look around a little bit. There's tons of these things, and they're usually they go they come in twenty. Mine, the one I use is a twenty four. I also have a thirty six, I think, which is smaller. And that's like if you're really uh, crazy about putting a lot of colors in, I try to keep my colors down to as little as possible for travel's sake. And I like I actually like to do a lot of mixing. So my the colors I have are just basically a warm and cool of. Uh, the primaries, and then some greens, and then my earth colors, and then that's about it. And is there a brand of gouache that you prefer? Not re I not really. I tend to use, I use usually uh, Windsor Newton and Holbein. And the reason I like the Windsor Newtons is that they're a little bit more rugged, which means that they kind of hold their shape a little bit more. The what I found, this is just me, but I found is, is that the saturation level on the Windsor Newtons isn't as, isn't as specialized as the Holbein's and the Holbein's I'll, I'll use, I'll have a tendency to use for more like, so like on that one you got right there, see that color that's in the lower bushes on the right hand side. The, the turquoise color? That, yeah, turquoise blue. That's like a uh, cobalt, cobalt turquoise that I kind of use for water a lot. And some sometimes my skies, and then that's a whole bind. But the uh, like the earth colors, like if you look at the wall in the background, that's all Windsor Newton because again the the Windsor Newtons they kind of I feel like they travel not travel a bit more but they're more sturdy. Okay. Where it's like that they'll they won't drip they won't run the whole binds have a little bit more of a a watery solution to them so sometimes they'll have a tendency to kind of drift a little bit more. Does that make sense? Yep. 
we're getting a lot of questions. There's a lot of interest in gouache. Um, so Virginia wants to know, do you use the same brushes for watercolor and for gouache? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. I, I, most of these are painted with a three quarter inch flat brush. And um, so, and Cynthia is asking, are all gouache colors opaque? And Maria wants to know, is gouache less transparent than watercolor? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely less transparent. But once again, it depends on how you, you I mean, the kind of amount of water you put into it. Um, you could get a transparent layer. Oh yeah, afterwards. yeah, it, it's a little bit on the, like the more, even when you, you paint transparently, it's a little bit more uh, on the opaque side. But yeah, you can get a trans, you know, again, I used to paint a lot of watercolor. You can get a lot of very sort of transparent like colors on it. Okay. Oh, we have a lot of questions here. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and so Wendy wants to know, do you use a fixative to set the layers? No, not at all. Okay. And what's the name of the brand of the box that you keep your paints in? I think you it's if you're not going by brand, right? Because it's changing. Yeah, all it's it's all sorts of they're a lot of them. Like I said, there's a lot of knockoffs. Uh usually the ones I that I have gotten is uh transom it's T R A N S O N. Transom. It's not a brand though, right? Is no. It? Uh uh. That's just the, the type of box. Is it yeah, if you go to if you go to Amazon.com and pop in that name, you'll probably come up with what the one I have here. Okay. And uh, oh, oh, and just a real quick, they're only about 12 bucks or 13 bucks, which is pretty good. What I would do is uh, here's a suggestion, sort of off the question, is I'd buy two of them. And the reason for it is is that the little clamps that hold the stuff down, uh, holds the lid down. Sometimes like after a while, like maybe a year or so, they'll break. One will break is that I pull it off, I cannibalize off the other one and then put the clamp on it because everything's uh, uh, fixable in these things. It's even got a little- It's the lid that becomes a problem, it wears out. Yeah, the little clamp, the lid's fine. The clamps um, have a little bit of a problem, it's like break sometimes. Yeah. But okay. I have a tendency to like really beat my equipment up too because it's in a backpack and I'm running all over the place doing this stuff. Yeah. Okay. A uh, question from Carl. Hi, Carl. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I didn't know you were in this call. Great that you're here. Carl is asking, is gouache tougher on sable brushes? Oh, oh I don't know. You know what? I I just use a regular brush that's got a good, probably it is, but that's again, that's one of the nice things I like about that transom box is that when you, like rather than the stuff being dry, is that you, it goes in and it's wet. So when you when you drop that brush into it, most of the time it'll just get sucked right up into the paint and you won't have to break through a crust or anything, especially if you recharge it kind of the night before. So um, I have a tendency to use brushes that are a little bit more sturdy just for the fact that like when you go out to Morocco, there's not a lot of art stores. And I do a, I, you know, do a, a lot of like pretty energetic painting on this. So. So brushes I use have a tendency to have a little bit more um, weight to them. So what kind of brush is it then? Oh, it's just like Robert Simmons brushes and stuff that I like that I'm, I'm taking a look. I'm li literally looking into my pack. Yeah. Um, some cobalt brushes, Coleman brushes. I got a mop brush. I got some uh, oil painting brushes. Like I said, oh, I love dagger brushes. So I got, I mean, it's just, it's not so much the brand. I just go into a store and then just start picking up brushes and taking a look at them. I like these rosemary uh, dagger brushes. I use those quite a bit. And then, uh, what is it? A Raphael brush from, I think it's Simmons. As you can, as you can tell, I'm really specialized about my equipment, huh? <laughs> well, uh, so you made me, you said this because I, I'm reading lots of questions and it's, I, I might've missed what you said, but is it an acrylic, um, sorry, is it a, um, uh, oh my goodness. What's, what's the bristle made out of? Oh God. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm, it's just like, it's, it's just a softer, uh, uh, natural and artificial brush. Okay. I, I wish I wish I was an equipment uh, um, geek when it came to stuff like that, but it's okay. It's no problem. Anna's asking, what's the best surface to use a gouache on? Oh, 
You know what? I think that comes up to personal preference. I mean, like I said before, I kind of like to do a lot of dry brushing. Uh, so, and then sometimes come up with a thicker paint. And so when you have a rougher surface, like a, a cold press, um, that, that solution will sort of like pop over the top. You can kind of even see it in this one. If you look to the lower left, uh, on there's a, on the ground, you can actually see the paper popping through the gouache yeah. and it gives a nice, yeah. So, um, that's why I like a rougher paper because it, it gives you a little bit more texture. But I painted on on hot press, which is a real smooth surface. Um, there's a um, um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Cottonwood Arts makes these really nice panels, uh, basically kind of illustration board, but it's their own make, which are, are really nice. I'll take those sometimes, but uh, that's my surface. I like I like cold press. I always have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got a lot of sketches to go through, and these are absolutely stunning. So we have a lot of questions still, but I, I we haven't even had a chance to talk about Morocco at all. But anyway, that's okay. Maybe we'll get to it at the end. Um, so Peter's asking, do you work from light to dark or vice versa? Um, I probably say light to dark. Uh, once again, that's that's one of the things I like about gouache is that you can actually go in and and paint dark and then put your lights over the top of it, if you're careful. I mean, it's, it's like anything else, is that it takes a little bit of, of uh, you know, practice to do that kind of stuff. And that, would, of course, what helps you in the field. Because, you, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but my stuff's always sort of a controlled panic, where you're, you're jumping from solution to solution to solution, and then seeing what kind of texture comes up. Uh, and this one that you're looking at right now, this is a marketplace in Fez. Uh -huh. And... Uh, I'm actually using watercolor pencils and color pencils at the end of it to come in and sort of pop little pieces of texture and detail out. I so, love that. I love that. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. And, and there's lots of cats, tons of cats in Morocco. There are. Oh my gosh. I saw yeah. many when I was there. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, Victoria is asking what kind of alcohol against molding? It's just rubbing alcohol. I'm just right? rubbing alcohol. Okay, and um, and Sue is asking about the colored pencils, which we just answered, uh, and uh, and Carolyn asked about the brand, which we already said was uh, Windsor and Newton and Holbein. Yeah. Okay. But that's only because I can't. I Daniel Smith stuff's really expensive, so I can't afford that. So <laughs> I'm yeah. just but a poor art professor. What can I say? Oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> so Sarah wants to know: Do all these transom boxes have rubber seals? Yeah. Yes, they do. Okay. And you and just got to clean them every now and then, but they're, they're, they're champs, man. I love working these things. Yeah. And Judy, uh, the question about the box uh, is that the brand's changing all the time. I think a lot are made in China and yeah. it's a different uh, maker all the time, but what you're looking for is the type of box, which is called a transom box. Um, just look, you know what, what I do is just look for what, um, you know, they'll give you a picture because I've seen the the um, brand name change on it, depending on the company. So it's it's not like, um, let me see if I can put this right. It's it's not like a Gucci bag knockoffs, but it's pretty much that all these companies, either they're changing makers or there's a market for them. So there's three or four manufacturers at least that make these things. And yeah. so when I do, when I go in and look for them, as I look at like, a, again, basically the picture I showed you and uh, uh, I go in there and buy it that way. Yeah. It basically to me, it looks like they're giant pill boxes, you know? The yeah. Boxes. Oh, you, you know what? That's, that's absolutely right. Except that um, this has a really nice rubber seal to it. Yeah. Yeah. Which um, pill boxes don't. Lots of questions here. Um, Susanna wants to know how often do you refill your palette? Uh, um, this one right here. I haven't, except for three colors, I really haven't refilled it for two or three years. Okay. And Elizabeth says, how do you prevent paint mixing in the palette when you're using the paint? Oh, it's it's great. You just, uh, you, it's literally like everyone's got its little own little territory. And you just make sure that the brush sort of goes in and then I'll sweep it up against the side of the little box thing. That's the one thing I like about it is that you, you don't get that much pollution uh, in mixing like uh, like in a wet uh, wet dry tray or something like that is every box for the most part it, you know it changes a little bit um 
every box has its own sort of um oh sort of unique edge to it so it doesn't the paint doesn't slop over it's great it's just sort of like it's wet too so you can just take the brush and kind of go right into the middle of the paint thing and just pop some paint out you know the only one i, I use a lot of in recharge all the time is the white so I am not keeping up with these questions, and I apologize. No, that's okay. Um, and uh, people are asking questions about previous images that we saw, but we have so many images to go through that I really don't want to go backwards. Um, and and uh, Terry is asking about the best brush hair for gouache, and I think we established that you have no idea. I have no idea. I just... <laughs> I just try it out and, you know, see how it works. And then I'll, you know, it's like you have your favorite children. I got, I got one, one or two favorite, favorite brushes. I think it's a Robert Simmons three quarters, something or other. And I just, uh, I have a tendency to probably use a, a pretty, not a stiff brush, but a, a like watercolor brushes are basically when I go into the store, I just go to the watercolor section and then just start look through the brushes there. I have a couple of oil paint brushes, but once again, when you look at the sky on this one, if you see the rain coming out of the clouds, or if you look at some of the texture on the uh, the landscape, like um, the furrowed fields, that's a uh, fan brush, an oil paint fan brush, because right. then you can pick the paint up and just sort of like, like kind of draw more streaks through it. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But I, I but have I, a question. Okay, can, can I ask my own question? Yeah, sure. Um, so I noticed that you really like that turquoisey color. That what was it called? Um, cobalt, cobalt turquoise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm noticing you use it a lot. Um, where I would probably, which is a kind of a greeny blue. Yeah. And um, so in this case, like here in the background, you can see, you know, your sky in your sketch. You've used that greeny blue, and I see it in a, a lot of your sketches. So you really is, it, is that your favorite color? Uh, I guess sort of it. Let me see. I'm just trying to think what my favorite color is. Um, my favorite color is probably ultramarine blue. So, but that one, what I do when I, when I paint these things is I'll paint this, you know, the sky will be the first thing I pop in. So I just, and then I'll mix up more of the sky color and you can kind of see it on that one too. And then that sky color goes into everything else because of the, the, you know, the sky dome color going basically down on top of everything um on the ground yeah but what, what i notice myself is um <clears throat> by using that uh, turquoisey color in the sky uh which is not the natural you know sky color um but it gives uh it gives the what it does is it kind of it's like a sepia photo you know it kind of gives your sketches a sort of vintage look i think that okay color. Do you I like know what that. I mean? Like it's like it's like from the nineteen seventies or something. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because a lot of the a lot of the people that I study, not study, that I look at their painting, is I'm I'm sort of a guy from the seventies. So, but I look at a lot of uh, painters from the fifties and sixties. So that totally makes sense. You know, yeah. so I'm I'm stealing the uh, you know William Wint stuff and Edgar Payne stuff and all sorts of you know, of course, John Singer Sargent stuff. And I'm seeing over here on the left-hand side of this sketch, uh, some uh, watercolor pencil work, which yeah. is gorgeous. Or or, poly or polychrome. So there's other things is I'll, I'll have a mixture of watercolor and polychrome pencils because the polychromes, like you can actually lay pencil down and then paint over the top of it and it'll resist. It'll give you a real nice kind of look sometimes. Yeah, cool. Okay, just trying to get through some of these questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm gonna go from the bottom and work up then. Um, so Zephy asks, are you concerned uh, much about cleaning the brush between colors? Um, that is a, that's a really good question. I don't know if I have a solid answer for that. I'd probably say, yeah, but I also, one of the things I do in my mixtures, you kind of see it. In fact, that one that pops up right here, you can see a lot in the walls where I'll paint, like I literally took the whole Oh, this is Fez. What a nice place. Um, sorry, you, you were talking about the tannery there. Yes, yes yeah, tannery's good. great. I've been in that exact spot. Yeah, the smell is overwhelmingly horrible. See, I I used to work on a ranch and a, and a dairy, 
I'm so yeah. used to that smell that I actually went down there and the and the guy said kept telling me asking me if I wanted mint to you know put underneath my nose and it's like yeah. no nah, I'm used to this I I actually like the smell. Oh no! Oh gosh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you that's what happens when you work with cows for about a decade. You get used to that. Oh, but what I was going to say is that whole background is painted with one yellow, okay. and then I. Like I said, I sort of dry brushed or even glazed over some of the brown and the blue colors over the top of it. So chances are on some place like over on the left hand side where the buildings are more in shadow, I probably didn't I did probably didn't wash off the uh, brushes between uh, colors. OK, um, uh, Sarah's asking, how many layers can you do with using blush before it gets muddy? Is there sort of a trick to prevent muddiness you can you could i can tell you i've screwed up on so many layers of stuff and had to go over and over and over it um i, I you could go 10 12 15 layers over the top if you're careful wow wow yeah i mean it's that's a nice thing i mean you're not going wet into wet into wet not expecting that but if you let something dry and i think you could probably see that uh now that you can see the real thing mm -hmm. you can see that in that shadowed part of the building in the back that I, that I basically kind of made up is that um, my guess is that looks like an area that I just went over about five or six times trying to match that shadow color and getting the vibrancy of the yellow through it. Yeah, yeah. Or or in the foreground, see the foreground where the uh, there's the side of the wall and it's kind of blue and brown and yellow. Mm, right, in the, right in the lower left part of the painting. Oh, of the painting, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like a cracked wall down here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's got to be at least five or six coats of paint on that. But it's, I think that's really great though, because it gives you this, um, this sense of the patina of, you know, yeah. like, which is what exactly you, you know, wanted to do. That's, that's, especially for a place like Morocco, everything in Morocco is patinaed, right? Yep. 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 And, yep. Then, and again, you can, you can see it on the wall and back of the two guys. Is I mean, you can see warm and cool colors laying over the top of one another. If you look at the wall on the right hand side, up above, uh, what next to the stairs, you can see blues laid over yellows, laid over uh, oranges and browns. Yeah, and then even in the lower left hand section next to, I'm, I'm seeing. Sorry about this. I'm seeing this right now in front of my face. If you look next to the guy with the beard that's standing up in the green pants, uh -huh. is if you look next to the wall there, you can see where I actually looks like. The paint was wet, and I took my thumb and rubbed my thumb over the top of it to get the texture on the wall. Okay, cool, very cool. Does that uh, make sense? It's uh, this. I think it's very exciting. Um, your your art and your use Thank of you. gouache. So, is gouache an ex if you you know if you wanted to kit yourself out with gouache, is that an expensive venture to get started? No more than, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, no more than watercolor. I mean, like I said, I haven't, I obviously have the colors for it, but some of these colors, I haven't recharged the the boxes for three or four years. Yeah. They've stayed, you know, the, the ones that I usually go through are the white, the ultramarine blue, I think the raw sienna a little bit, and then the lens and crimson. That's about the ones that I just I just pound on all the time. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. I like that one. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I like that one. I mean, I, we talk about memories and and what Morocco's like. Yeah. This this is one of those ones where I look at it and go, oh yeah, that was so cool. It's so great. Because it's it's. A what were you gonna day. say? What, what's that? It was just like a great moment, a great day for you. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I Like I, I, we kind of mentioned before is Morocco was so different than I thought it was going to be, even after researching it. And you're right. We pulled up on this high mesa in the Atlas Mountains. And, man, I just had to get out. And there's sheep all around you. And there's goats. And you're sitting there and you're painting. And they come up trying to eat your paint. And it was really super cool. That's but, great. I'm glad you had these wonderful memories. Uh of Morocco, it it really is a, a, a different place, a completely a very fascinating place. Um, so I I would like to go back. Uh, just I've only been there once, and um, we did the full tour, 
of the country, um, Fez, Marrakesh, Casablanca, uh, the, I think there were five cities and uh, we did a full tour of the whole thing and it was it was amazing it's really interesting so a few comments um, let's see uh, so per, uh, Peter wants to know do you always do plein air and, ske and sketch in the moment or do you do any studio work oh yeah now, I'll do some I'll do studio work but most of the time um, yeah I, I, most of it's plein air I'd say 85% of it uh, but on some of the some of the stuff that I do is I just I'll be either practice in the house or if I'm working on a commission, if somebody wants a certain thing, then I'll I'll work on it in my studio. Um, can I can I make one other mention just off sort of off not off topic but just about this? Yeah. So people are asking me like, or even you are asking me about the watercolor to to gouache part. Uh -huh. If you look at the in almost the entire ground of that. That's that's to me is painted really watercolory. I did it in one back one or two passes with really really super transparent watery um, colors or mixtures. And then on the right hand side, you can even see I'm doing wet into wet, where I'm taking the or even on the left hand side, I'm doing a lot of wet into wet stuff where it's still got its solution and I'm dropping in other colors. So. Uh... This, it's just so beautiful, really, um, Gary. What you've done you. here, you're using, you know, uh, the, the thicker opaque uh, strokes, you know, one on top of the other. Mm -hmm. And then you're using blending, thinner, uh, you know, like tea, um, yeah. consistency, like watercolor. And just, I mean, it's all in this one sketch. You can see, you know, your skill set is really incredible, very impressive. Well, thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Like I said, though, I think of it's it's always like if you're inside my head when I'm doing it, it's like there's this little chicken running around in circles trying to paint, trying to get it right. Well, you're getting it right. You're definitely getting it right. This is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I want to go back to uh, some of these questions that people are asking. Sure. Uh, I'll stick as long as you want to stick. <laughs> uh, so, um. Virginia says, uh, asks, we haven't really talked about wait time before you can over a paint. I don't think she means, I think she means you can layer on. 10 seconds. Oh, okay. Really? Dry no, it dries fast. fast. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it dry even in a really cold, a fairly cold situation, it'll dry pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, in the hot, windy Morocco, it would definitely <laughs> dry quickly, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. And oh, she is asking, what kind of container do you carry, use for carrying water? Uh, really heavy duty, uh, um, sort of like backpacking shaker bottles, okay. water bottles, you know, with a, like the, the real heavy duty ones that have got a real good se uh, se sealable lid to it. And Jim is asked, saying she, he loves the density and fullness of the images. Can you describe your process? My what? Your process. My process? Well, I, once again, like this, like using this one as an example, um, we were going, we were, we were starting on one side of this uh, part of the Sahara Desert, and we were out there for two days on a camel safari, and we reached this pass, and on the left hand side was um, sunset, and on the right hand side, a full moon was coming up. Wow, and, that's and, That's cool. Yeah, it was. it was. So when you look at that sky, so here's a good example of, of technique. If you look at the sky, I laid it down with it. Probably my guess is an ultramarine blue with a, just a little bit of uh, limbs and crimson in it and laid it in one pass really lightly because I knew over on the left hand side, there was still a little dust in the air on the sunset. So I laid that down. Once again, made a really good solution of um, a big, a lot of solution of that blue and then went into the, uh, um, the sand dunes and just laid in a huge amount of, um, God, I almost wish, I, wish you guys could see my cursor, but if you look at the lighter local color of the yellow and the sand dune, I just laid that in as a huge gigant with a big brush, like a, I think a, an inch wide brush. Well, that's not huge, but for me, um, laid that down and then put the oranges in over the top of it. And then got, again, once again, got that down, then looked at the, 
the shadow colors and laid that light purple in, but the light purple had some orange in it. So that sort of mixed up with the other stuff. And then after that, I'd come back in and kind of try to nail in the shadows a little bit more because the sun's starting to set. And then right at the end of it, I dry brush in some texture. You can see that with the fan brush over on the right hand side next to the in the sand dunes. You can see that intermediate part in between the um, oh, up, up above. Like, yeah, right there, right there and above to the right. Yeah, there. So if you look at that whole sand dune, you can see the whole process right there. Yeah. The yellow lay down. The yellow with some orange, then I'm laying some purple in with that. So again, it's still um, using wet on wet, like in that little purplish area where the shadows are. And there's a little pieces of brush that are sticking out that are throwing cast shadows off them. And then the intensity level of the orange over on the right-hand side where the camels are. And then at the last step, I came in with a mixture of orange and purple and with a fan brush. And then if you look at those vertical uh, uh, kind of diagonal lines to show the texture or the direction of the sand dune lies exactly where you got the cursor. Yeah. 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 Wow. Uh, so Gary, it, it seems to me, I'm seeing a lot of squared off brushes, not so much oh, yeah. brushes. Is that right? Yeah. Tons of them. Yeah. So you're a squared off brush person. I'm a squared off. I'm a square guy. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so back to the questions. Um, Lydia says, thank you for the talk. Very informative and inspiring. Your work is sensational. I told thank you. you. Thank to you. Say I told you so, but yeah. <laughs> I try. And uh, Florence is asking, how long does it take to make one sketch? Like a, you know. Oh my God, <laughs> it's funny. It's funny you put this one up. This was the biggest pain in the butt of the entire trip. This was about four hours, and mm -hmm. I could not get. I could not. It was really hard to simplify up all that rock, uh, and make it legible and re and readable. Yeah, and it's funny that she was like, "How long does it take?" It's like I'm looking at this, going, "Oh man, that was my my heartbreak." And going back to the studio question is, yeah, this one when I got home, I spent about an hour, an hour and a half, just nailing down some of the bigger rock faces because I I, I got so confused with all of the the confusion <laughs> that yeah. I kind of lost kind of lost my way there. But the sky, see again, the the sky's first shot. I, I got lucky. I, I really like that sky because it's it's got a real sort of a primordial sort of feel to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I absolutely stunning, Gary. It's really so beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, so I'm going to go back to my questions because there's still a yeah, lot yeah. there. I'm fine. Um, Keep uh, going. <laughs> So um, I, I'm going to, I don't want to really ask questions that are specifically about um, sketches that we've already passed because it's too hard to remember and I don't want to skip, I don't want to scroll back. Um, so Mel is asking, how many brushes do you use in one plein air painting typically? Usually about three. Okay. And they're all squared off ones? No, usually, here's my, I usually use a square, like a squared, um, just a regular old square brush, three quarters to kind of lay everything out. And then I'll bring in a dagger brush. Uh, again, not too small of a dagger brush. I'll bring that in for like, if you look at the uh, the green, the brush and the trees, I'll usually use that. And then probably one of the, the ones that I won't use a lot, but for real good special effects is, the, is that fan brush. Cause I'll use that for like some dry brushing stuff. Okay. Usually right. about three or four brushes. Some sometimes I'll use a a slightly smaller um a slightly sm a smaller square off brush, and then sometimes I'll use a rigger brush for if I'm putting in a lot of like telephone lines and smaller stuff like grading on on windows or such like stuff like that. Right. Um. And so a couple other questions about Morocco. What month were you traveling there? We went in May June. Um. Just a second here. Something came up on my screen. I got to get rid of it. Uh, May, June. We got really lucky. It was a little bit cooler, uh, about usually about 10 degrees cooler than it, than it usually was. I wouldn't, the guide that we had, which is a really super cool guide. I'm more welcome to turn all you guys on to him. Is um, It's usually about middle of June is about the latest you go. Lisa, that 
to when you get to fall. Fall's good again, but it just yeah. gets horrendously freaking hot there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and so, um, Wendy had a good question. Do you sketch out your uh, your painting before you paint it? Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Maria says, "Amazing work." Okay, thank, thank you. For that answer. Um, let me see. Uh, Mel wants to know: Do you paint the entire painting with one brush? I think we probably established that you don't. No. Um. So, uh, Cynthia says, "Thank you. I love your comparison of painting with gouache, similar to oils." And Kathleen's asking: Do you ever use pre uh, use dried pre panned gouache or only tubes? Just tubes. Okay, tubes into your. Yeah, it's 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 such a pain to get through the at least for me to get through that ca the cakes and get the the brush to like real. The nice thing I like about that that uh, uh, palette that I use is you can go in there and just get some you know you. Um, you get some really, really nice fluid color, right? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're not, and it's saturated. So you can like pick up a large mount, like like for this one. So when you look at the sky or you look at the mountains in the back, it's a fully loaded brush. And again, to, to go back to why I use squash, if you look at that mountain on the far right-hand side in the back, mm -hmm. I must've screwed that thing up three or four times and it's starting to rain. And I'm about ready to chuck the whole thing into the, into the river. Um, but I kept plowing away at it. And so then, like I said, the nice thing I like about gouache is the stuff that you lay in underneath it, you can mix right over the top of it and it'll come back up. And sometimes you get some really nice juicy uh, neutral grays by doing that. You can see that in the uh, maybe even on the left-hand side with the um, next to the fortress on the left-hand side of the composition, you can see I painted all the mountains in the background. And then as I'm painting, that storm came over and like that, those walls of water were going over the mountains. It's like, oh, cool. I'll just wet up my fan brush and just go back and forth and like literally just kind of obliterate the paint that was there underneath, but you can still see it poking through yeah. the underpainting. Yeah. Uh, and um, let me think. I had a question here. Uh, Sorry, I'm probably talking too much. No, it's, it, I, I'm glad there's so many, I, I don't usually get this many questions. Um, let, let them at, let me have, I got all I that. I know, I'm trying to stay on top of it. Um, let's see, uh, do you keep, uh, so Virginia wants to know, she says, it's a shame that there's no written notes or dates on your sketches. Do you keep a record of your memories? Yeah, they're on the back, uh, on the back page. So when oh. you look, at, if you flipped over this page, yeah, on the right hand side, there's notes written on there. Yeah. So someone asked a question earlier and that I meant to get to, and that was that, um, like, I, essentially the question is, are you, um, when you're doing clouds, are you painting the white on top of the dark or are you allowing the paper to come through and just painting the dark parts? I, I, it's a, it's a cop out, but the answer is both. Okay. Is that a lot of, well, I, let's put it this way. I try to make it where the paper comes through. But I also, see, again, this is why I like gouache, is that you can go over the top of that and get sort of more of a fluttery, uh, wispy sort of cloud. And then if you need to, you can go right over the top of it with a really super opaque white and just block out a really nice, heavy foreground or, or scrumptious cloud. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, so Judy is asking, do you find that your colors dry darker or lighter? She says, I'm new. And I find that when I layer on a light color, it dries darker. Yep. And that's it. To, the question she says, I tend to like a one or two layer look. Is she doing something wrong? No, it's, it's whatever yanks your chain. I, I mean, I would, I would love to be able to crank these out in one or two uh, levels, but like I said, like that area on the right hand side is that sometimes things just don't go right and you have to just go over like for me you have to go over and over and over again just to get the effect and my big thing is is i'm i'm an illustrator i mean that's my my old vibe is um went to school school and became an anim, uh, an illustrator so i love details right so a lot of times i have to like constantly um go back and say nope simplicity 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 right yeah Okay. Um, and somebody was asking, what are you using for, as a, your sketching tool at the beginning when you're just making your first sketch? Oh, a pencil. Just, just a pencil. regular 2B pencil or whatever I happen to, to grab a hold of. 
Some sometimes I'll paint I'll do a paint sketch. But that's mainly because I'm stupid and I probably didn't bring a pencil with me. <laughs> um so are do you ever um uh, make these um sketchbook uh, sketches into larger paintings in your studio? Nope. He's just he's just uh stay like I just I just like the sponta spontaneity of it. Right, right. I mean if someone asks to do a commission, yeah, I'll I, in fact I chances are I don't even make them that much larger. Uh, I keep probably keep everything about this size. It's kind of funny because when I was in graduate school, uh, in fact, I, I finished a piece about three years ago for the uh, L.A. County Museum, or actually for uh, Claremont Museum, and um, it's eight feet by 26 feet. It's a drawing. Wow. Yeah, it's and it's a landscape. It's an overhead view of a creek, right? So um, up above me in the, in on Mount Baldy. But yeah, wow. it's eight, and it only took me seven days to do it. Wow, what did you use the sketch with? Th that thing? Yeah. A charcoal. Wow. Big wow. clunky piece of charcoal, a block. Okay. And Perry wants to know what's the largest gouache painting you've ever done? Um, I'm looking right here. Not that big, probably around about um, 12 by 20. 12 by 20 inches. Yeah, inches, sorry, the feet. <laughs> God, can you imagine how long that would take? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, want, I should have known it was inches. And no, no, feet. that's I should have I should have thought about that more. Um, so Carolyn's asking, does tone or color fight for your attention as a dominant element in your sketch? Say that again. I missed part of that. Does tone or color uh, fight as a dominant element in your? Oh sketch? my God! Wow, that is a that's an interesting question. I know. See, I, you know what? I I think I'm very object oriented. So for me, it's stuff like like because I love I love nature. I go out in nature. I've been going out in nature from all the way up to Mount from Mount McKinley down to wherever. Just I love sitting out in nature. And so for me, like I said before, it's kind of like like a tree that interests me or a bunch of trees. I can I, even by looking this one or this one right. So uh, the light. I, I, I'm an object guy, so I have a tendency to paint objects as my focal point. Yeah. Okay, so Cynthia is asking, do you uh, is is gouache a lifting color the way watercolor is? Wow, that's another good question. Um, lifting as in which way? Well, you know, when you're using watercolor, if you put a color down, some some watercolor pigments are lifting. You can, you know, dab at them and just pull them right out. Oh yeah, yeah. These yeah, <laughs> I'd say almost every gouache color is a lifting color. That's what I like about it. Is that like, like again? If you look in the back, if you look at down the the hallway on this one, you can see that I painted the orange underneath, and then when I painted the purple over the top of it for the for the bounce shadow that's that's back there, it actually lifted up the orange. Here. Yeah. Yeah. But I probably you know it's because it's so opaque. You don't really need to do a lot of lifting. You just paint over top. Yeah, but you know what? There there's a lot of lifting that takes place on it that you are pulling up colors. From underneath it that's i mean i mean i try to do it in one pass but when you look at this one to, for instance uh yeah thank you when you look at this that bounce light that's coming off the building that you can't see off to the right back into this building and it's adobe is that you know you haven't like basically orange bouncing in orange is that i painted it much more uh toned down the value level was like uh, was much more diffused and then I came right over the top of it with that really bright orange before I put all the objects on it. Mm -hmm. And then so what it did is it sort of it sort of grabbed a hold of some of the oranges underneath and it, it mixed it back into it. it's like almost like wet on wet technique. If that answers the question. Yeah. Um, Tiffany is asking, um, do you ever use a varnish or gloss coat once the picture is fully dry? Nope. Just to never. That? No. OK. Yep. Never. OK. I'm just afraid of what it'll do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, let me see what else we have. I, I I haven't had to think of hardly any questions myself because there's been so many coming in here. Um, let me think here. Uh, I think we covered that one. Um, so there's a question here. Judy's asking, do you find that Holbein gives you a problem in mixing as they have some non-standard multi-pigments. Nope. 
I I don't have I don't have much problem with it. I just I just thrash away at it and hope it turns out okay. Yeah. And, and uh, Judy wants to know how many watercolor pencils and colored pencils do you should carry with you? Uh, 25. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, and we already answered the question about how long it has to wait to add your next layer. Peter's saying dark to light, light to dark, or agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that question. That is definitely agnostic. That is like, it's all over the map. Like you can see on this one, this, this is even a good example. If you look to the far left hand side, um, there's a there's a wall again. Once again, I didn't quite I couldn't quite grab a hold of it with the right intensity. And so again, after painting everything and having it all laid out, I realized that I really wanted to get that light coming in and hitting that wall. So you can see a lot of white paint dry brush right over the top of the orange paint underneath it with the uh, the shadow like coming underneath the roof on the left hand side. Mm hmm. I think this the orangey yellow that you've used here on this wall is also it really has a glow. Yeah. Beautiful. I got lucky. Yeah. Um, and so going back to drawing, um, so um Wendy wants to know how much time do you spend sketching out your composition compared to going straight in with the paint? Um, you know what? It depends. Um, depends on like how long I think I'm gonna be able to have to sit there and do it. Um Usually, so I'd probably, I'd say about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so Judy, Jane asks that she thinks that it would be good to experiment with the uh, gouache on watercolor, but she, she thinks that she might have ruined it. No, it's, well, you know, of course you're going to ruin it. I mean, there's like, I mean, I'm looking at any of these things. I'm just looking at all the quote unquote mistakes on the inside of them, as opposed to the stuff that, uh, works uh -huh. and how lucky you get like like on this one you're showing me right now i think one of the one of the things that i got again if you don't take the chances you're never going to get it is the face of the man that's holding the donkey yeah i did it on one pass and it's real you know again this is a i think it's around about oh eight inches by 22 inches and i nailed it first pass with a little bit of uh, color pencil work over the top of it. Yeah. And I looked at that and I thought, man, how many drawings of people's faces that I've have made that are put on the inside of this face, right? How much practice you do and how many yeah. times you screw up. And then when you come down to it where you got to get, get into it and get it fast and then get the shadow pattern is you're just, it's like you're a prize fighter. You're just, you're just poised. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to put in the hours, right? Like oh my God. You get better the more sketches you do the better you're going to get um so where are we here in this uh physically like geographically where are what's the town this is uh alt in uh alt ben hatu this is a uh, the if you've seen just about any sword and uh sword and sorcery movie uh like you've seen gladiator right or game of thrones this is the little town they film all that stuff in. Okay, and is that it's pile a, of junk in the in the middle? Is that uh, like backdrops from movie films? No, <laughs> that's just uh, the, I I stumbled into this courtyard, and it's just the all the debris that's left over. I think they're going to do an addition to one of their uh, adobe buildings, right. and it's just the stuff they pile up onto the side. There's a there's a donkey. You can see the donkey's head sort of poking out, a little white next to that big gate. Uh huh. Yeah. There's a little donkey there, and um, it's funny, I was watching Game of Thrones a couple of weeks ago, and all of a sudden I blinked my eyes, and there's a big sword fight right in the middle of this courtyard. And you, and there you go. It's like, yeah, it's, a, it's about, a, it's about an hour and a half outside of um, Marrakesh. So I have a question for you about um, safety um, uh, in this country when you were sketching there. Did you feel safe sitting uh, right on the street? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, um, you get a little bit, it's kind of funny. I was, I was looking at, I've been looking at other different artists doing their stuff. Uh, Ian, Ian's been there a couple of times and done drawings there and he's, he's drawn a lot of people. And I kind of found when I was sitting there that a lot of people kind of got, sometimes got a little bit antsy, usually older people, kids, kids would want you to paint, to draw them. I mean, I was doing portrait drawings of kids all over the place there, but, um, I felt safe all over. That's one of the things that was like a little bit of a, I wouldn't say a surprise, but a surprise was 
wherever we went, it was really pretty cool. You'd get, you know, you'd get looks sometimes, but everything was really good. I mean, we were there for five weeks. Yeah, I know. It's incredible. Yeah. And where was this one painted? This is in Marrakesh, right off the main courtyard. Yeah. Yeah. One of the few places you could actually sit there and draw and paint. It's just so claustrophobic and trying to find. It's one thing that, that surprised me when I was there because I was planning on doing a whole bunch of market scenes. And as you know, it's so chaotic in most yeah. of the alleyways there just to find somewhere to, to wedge yourself into a corner somewhere was insane yeah yeah this is pretty wide for for yes uh, for a souk oh believe me this took me about two or three hours to find this one yeah yeah cool all right i don't wanna we have so many beautiful sketches let's see how we're getting we're doing well and um, but i didn't uh, want to uh have to you gotta, you gotta hit the so one one Pardon me? You have to hit that uh, SO one. Oh my, I like that. I just want to get through some so people have a chance to see them. Yeah. Okay, going back to the comments and questions, Carolyn says the glow you spoke of is incredible from viewing your sketches. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. That's nice. And um, let's see what else we have here. Um, and we asked that one already. So going back to that drawing question, something like this, boy, I really, that's the one I have to really get down, right? I have to make sure that everything mechanically is kind of set out right and the proportions and scale are right. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. there's a lot of detail here and everybody's moving, right? So that would Well, the nice thing is, is that, you know, like, again, I'll, nice thing is I wrote an anim, a couple of animal drawing books so I can draw horses okay. Um, the other part is, is that the, that, everybody's going in a loop so you may not have the same horse in front of you all the time but you definitely have somebody else that moves right into the same spot so you can just replicate it yeah 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 an amalgam of mm -hmm. horses. lovely very nicely done and carolyn wants to know is it hard to know when to stop <laughs> uh when i want to pull my hair out or uh, scream in, in distress i don't know <laughs> probably the point where you like i said i'm a detail person so when I start going in there and noodling with little teeny tiny details on something, it's either to fix something. Most of the time it's the shadows. I'll go in and do the shadows the last part. That's when I know I'm finished. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. I'm the same. I do my shadows at the end. Yeah. And Perry wants to know, do you, do you what's your setup? Do you use a tripod or do you work on your lap? Both. Okay. Both, most, in fact, to tell you the truth, I took a tripod with us here but you know you know the souks they're like there's no way you're going to set a tripod up on those things no, and no. i found most of the time i was just sitting with the stuff on my lap yeah drawing yeah and, and kathy's paint. asking have you ever used pre-panned dried gouache like stone ground gouache from canada or do you only use tubes i just use the tubes okay like and i said they're really sturdy Gary, where are we here in this sketch? This is Essawan. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's on the coast. Okay. About two hours uh, uh, west of uh, Marrakesh. And here you can really see how you've used um, the, the gouache effectively for um, the water. Oh, thanks. And it kind of has a very illustrative feel, like a children's book almost. <laughs> you know what? It's funny you mentioned that. I, was, I, I always think the exact same thing. I look at these... Uh, friends of mine that are painters, they paint these like really beautiful, atmospheric, soft, gentle stuff. And I, like I said, I love objects. So I'm going to go in there and go, man, I want that boat to look like a boat. There's you know, So, you know, every stitch and every, you know, uh, floater and tire and tie on that you can get on that thing. You're right. It's, it's my sin. What can I say? I think this is just absolutely stunning. Thank I you. mean, it makes me feel like I want to jump in that boat. See where it goes. Yeah, you don't want to jump in the water. No. <laughs> These are really beautiful, Gary. Thank oh, you thanks. so much see, for sharing. Once again, see, I painted the whole thing kind of lit up and like it is on the bridge part. And then I mixed up a, another solution of like a purple 
and then painted the shadows over the top of it. So I picked up some of that yellow from the, the local color of the bridge underneath it. These are just beautiful. Really, really beautiful. I love the shapes of these boats too. Oh yeah. I mean, you've really exaggerated the shape and, and made it even more charming than it already is. They're so fat and chunky and gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Really fun. I love it. Well, that guy's standing in the water. Yeah. Well, they're used to it though. Yeah. 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 And I love these little, I love those uh, pigeons that you had down in the front. Seagulls. Seagulls. Yeah. Now there's there's your dry brush. So that's the thing I like. If you look on the bottom part of that boat, yeah, there's that fan brush and the dry brush and the different layers working together. Yeah, and it 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 go it it works so well to create that sort of peeled paint, uh, you know, texture kind of feel. Beautiful, lovely. Um, let me see if I have more questions up here for you. Sure, I'm um, here. So Sarah wants to know, she, she says, um, you know, obviously you, you photograph the scene first, but do you ever just go back and paint from the photo or do oh, you yeah. paint? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like on this one, I knocked in the boats. I not like, so if, if you, if you look at something sort of funky here and I'll show you is that if you look at the photograph, notice the boat in the back, see, it's yeah. a completely different color. So what I did is I replicated the one on the front and then just put them in the, put that one in the back because it made compositional more sense. And then, but yeah, all the rigging, uh, a lot of those boat ones, like I'm on piers that are actually moving. So to, to put stuff like the rigging down or finish off the ladder or some of the, like the guy that's back there paint, like actually painting and fixing the boat. Um, that would, for me, that would be kind of insane because you're, you wouldn't be able to get the integrity of that rigging or the lines or some of the smaller stuff. So yeah, that stuff I'll do back in my studio. Okay. And um, so here's another question from- Or, or in the hotel room. <laughs> here's another question from Orts uh, who asks, uh, she says, um, I often struggle with composition in my sketches, what to include, what to leave out. How do you go with comp composition? Do you start with an overall thumbnail or do you start with a particular detail and you grow your script sketch from there until you've reached the sketchbook margins? Well, generally what I do is I go foreground, middle ground, background when I do my compositions. So before I even put a boat in here, I'm hitting the horizon line, then I'm hitting the pier on the right-hand side. And then even before getting the boat in, I, I'll, like, I, I'm trying to remember this when I lock this in, is that I hit the top of the boat. So you're right. So I see how close it comes to the edge of the top part of the composition and then how far the back of the boat Uh Brenda, you were kind of minute, noticing that last one that the boats look kind of stubby. That it's kind of like I had to take I had to take a look at the composition and go, well, either I can paint the composition the way that I see it, or I can take that boat and make it a little bit more stubbier and be able to get everything else in for the scale of the of the composition size that I'm looking for. Right. So generally, what I do is I'll just sort of abstractly sketch it out first, and then like on this one, I'll make sure that I got the shape of the boat the cabin and then i'll see where the prow of the front of the boat is in relationship to the ones in the uh, the other ends of the boats and then draw a line across that and lay the boats in backwards does that make any sense yeah 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 a uh, few more questions here um uh fran says you just purchased your five minute animals and pets because Yay! The sketches are so beautiful and um and uh, Perry wants to know if you have a tip for painting thin lines with a rigger or a flat brush. How do you do that? Uh, train yourself. Uh, I know that sounds really kind of simplistic, but like a lot of times what I'll do is I'll try to use a brush that I'm already using. That way I don't have to switch brushes. I'll, I'll usually use a dagger brush uh, because again, you can, you can turn it on the side and get a really nice big wide stroke. And yeah, that's what I got on the bottom of the boat. When you look at the bottom of the boat and those individual uh, little textural lines, kind of lost and found textures. You know, some people have lost and found edges when it comes to values. I have lost and found textures. So sometimes you'll kind of paint one and let it disappear into the background. Um, what I'll do is I like a dagger brush because you can sort of train your hand. There's a good example, right? So all those little lines there are done mostly with the dagger brush. Okay. All right, that's great. 
Um, so, uh, Connie wants to know your brand of watercolor pencils. Oh God, there's a, a again. Um, I just collect a whole bunch of them. And uh, was it Carnage? Nosh? I'm trying to remember the name of those exactly. I'm kind of looking in the back or in an imaginary person in back of me that's supposed to hand me one. Uh, all sorts of different ones. Uh, the polychrome ones, I like the Faber-Castell ones because those uh, you can sharpen those up. And for stuff like this, if you're doing rigging or if you're doing, um, oh, it's like smaller lines, you can use that. Not so much on this one, maybe on the last one, you can, you can kind of see that. And the polychromes, as I mentioned before, you can draw, you can you can draw stuff on the page, and then you can watercolor or or you can paint over the top of it. And a lot of times those lines will pop right through. There'll be a resist. Uh watercolor pencils, just everything from God kind of the, I like the the ones that are a little bit more uh juicy and wax not waxy, but a little bit more buttery. So we can put them down and then I'll paint over the top of them to get a different texture. Or you can see on some of the, the previous paintings where I'd lay the painting down and then use the side of the pencil and then actually use the rougher part of the page to give you a different sort of textural feeling of the stucco or whatever the covering of the building was. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's excellent. So, so I'm trying to I'm trying to rip all this stuff through my brain right now and trying to get a handle on all this information. I think we've squeezed you dry. <laughs> no, you haven't. No, you haven't. <laughs> So have a, a couple of questions left. Um, Joseph wants to know if you use a limited palette and what are your go-to colors? Uh, usually ultramarine blue, alinsum crimson. I'm looking at, let me, literally I'm going to open my kit right now and take a look, All right? So I need visual aids. Yeah, alinsum crimson, um, ultramarine blue, uh, burnt sienna, because you the burnt sienna, Oh, excuse me, the burnt umber and the, the uh, ultramarine blue, if you mix them together, it makes a really nice black, which is what I use. Um, yeah, that's usually, let me see, flame red. Cobalt turquoise. Yeah, cobalt turquoise, of course, you're right. And uh, peacock blue. Oh, you know, my my uh, my go-to uh, sky color, believe it or not, is schmalt blue, which is a Holbein color. I've never heard of that one. Yeah, it's it's uh, Virginia Heim, who's a friend of mine, is really good urban. She turned me on to that one. She's so great. yeah, She's so Virginia. S S M A L T Schmalt. Okay. It's well, it's I'm a, not going to put you under any pressure, but I'm I'm hoping that I can convince Gary to do a demo for us at some point. Just call me, call me, tell me when. Oh, that's so great! Thank you you want to do it right now? I'll go get my stuff. I'll get myself. I'll say it up right now. No, it's okay. <laughs> Um, well, uh, anyway, so some, some fabulous questions, some really great information. Thank you so much, Gary. You're um, welcome. Tiffany has thumbed it up. She says, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge in such an approachable, honest way. The travel sketches just make one want to get out and take a trip with a sketchbook and wash. Yep. So, yeah. That's if, if, people, if people got other questions, they know where to find me. They can, you know, go to the Instagram or they could even, uh, I got a whole bunch of demos on Facebook. You, I mean, excuse me, on YouTube. They can take a look at there. There's some painting demos there. Well, I'm hoping, Gary, that you'll come back and chat. Of course I will. What do you mean? Time. It's an, it's an <laughs> honor to hang out with you guys and uh, talk about this stuff. Thank you so much. So, everyone, I just want you to know that we are will be offering more free interviews and demos coming up in 2024. And off the top of my head, Renata LaHall is going to be doing a free demo on February 28th. Tickets are still available, and Sebastian Thoman is going to be doing a free demo on March 11th. It's just all the thing. It's all the rage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think it really helps to be over the shoulder of an artist and actually actually watch them lay the paint on. And as you watch someone, you realize, oh, he did that first, and then he did that afterwards. And, you know, you just really learn a lot by watching a person do it from right over their shoulder. So uh, if you are new to Studio 56, I'd like to encourage you to go to our website, www.studio56boutique.com. And right away, there'll be a pop-up that says subscribe to our newsletter. And if you do that, then you will be alerted when we have other free interviews or free demos coming up. So thank you so much, Gary. My pleasure. I had, I had a blast. So, yeah. Good. Do you have any last words you'd like to share with anyone? Yeah, go out and uh, make lots of mistakes and try your best and plow along with the stuff. Uh, it's, it's, if you're used to watercolor, 
don't be intimidated. It's really close to watercolor. Well, thanks everyone for popping in and chatting with us again today. It's really a great privilege to be able to share the art of these beautiful, wonderful artists like Gary. And Thank I you. hope everyone has a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. So okay. bye for now. Adios.